So um, let's remind the lovely audience um, just very briefly who you are and what you do at Red Hat and with OpenShift. All right. So you all know me by now. I'm Diane Mueller. I'm the Director of Community Development for the whole cloud platform BU now. So I get the operator framework and OpenShift and a little bit of OpenStack and anything else they throw at me. Um, so um, it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm Ilkka Tengval, Solution Architect at Red Hat here in Espo, and uh, mainly doing OpenShift, OpenStack, cloud-related automation stuff. And uh, Jeremy Brown, Red Hat Open Innovation Labs. I kind of look after the whole thing here in Europe. Tero uh, Hanen, OpenShift Specialist Solution Architect, uh, work in pre-sales, so I do, uh, do these POCs that are so successful and people buy OpenShift. <laughs> <laughs> and he is so modest. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm also that, yeah. And Ed Seymour, uh, working with our customers to help them with OpenShift adoption. Yeah, first of all, uh, as Diane mentioned earlier with you know the cross-community collaboration, I want to thank Diane for letting me have this chance to um, collaborate. Get, collaborate, yeah, and uh, learn more about OpenShift and also get to know the wonderful community that um, she works with. So thanks for that. Thank you. And uh, speaking of community, and um, because I also you know, do something similar, and um, you mentioned earlier on today with the change of the name of, from OpenShift uh, Origin to OKD, and it wasn't mentioned until Ed came up and you know, talked a bit about it. Maybe you can tell us more about um, what you want the messaging to be like and um, how, how you want it to do. Well, well conceptually, when um, OpenShift was first created, it was, as I said earlier, uh, a Ruby on Rails platform as a service using MongoDB, and we had all these wonderful, um, almost proprietary um, naming conventions of gears and cartridges. And for the, fir I've been with Red Hat now a little over five years, so for the first couple of years, um, we were always trying to evangelize that platform as a service. Um, and then when we pivoted to Kubernetes, um, the open source project has always been um, Origin. And when we pivoted, we kept the same name for the open source project that is under the hood. But um, it didn't really reflect what the, na the true nature of the open source project was. So the renaming um, initiative is really around making it very clear that our open source um, project that is upstreamed into OpenShift all the products is a, a community distribution of Kubernetes. So um, I think a, there was a little confusion about that. So we're hoping that um, by coming up with OKD as a name, um, much like RDO, it means you, we're not um, legally allowed to say exactly what it is, you know, or call it an acronym. <laughs> it's not an acronym. OKD is the name. Um, you can think of it as OK, Diane, you know, <laughs> really? <laughs> so anytime anyone says OKD in the engineering team, I think they're just agreeing with me, right? So yes, I need that in OKD. Yeah, cool. So, um, but it really is all about um, making sure that you're, the people who are using the project are aware that they are getting a distribution of Kubernetes every time they download and install it. So um, we are, we're hoping the name change isn't too confusing. I don't think it is. Um, and to make sure that it's really not that confusing, we didn't change the repo at all. Um, so any of your scripts, you know, if your playbooks or anything that you wrote um, or any download um, automation that you've written should absolutely still work as is. So we're trying just really to make it very clear that this is not a fork of Kubernetes. It's not a platform as a service anymore. It is a, a distribution of Kubernetes, if that is, is clear okay, as Okay, Diane, me. I go. agree. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we hope to hear more about OKD as we go along. And uh, I'm thinking maybe we should have something to called uh, TKC. Dr. Kai Carol. Yes. Dr. Kai means, of course, Carol. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so maybe we can let Daryl ask himself a question for now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, Daryl, what about the K native? That's a great question. Uh, uh, Google announced, uh, you know, uh, Google Next K native initiative, which is basically a framework uh, to help build serverless solutions on Kubernetes. So it uh, uses a custom resource definitions to build the basic glue between the serverless implementation and, and Kubernetes. And the uh, Red Hat's 
platform functions will be built on top of Knative, uh, and we are contributing to it. And there's a proof of concept code on GitHub at the moment that yeah. Ben Browning has been doing. Yeah. So check it out. I, he, and a demo. There's a video demo as well. He's published a blog and a demo. Oh. So uh, yeah. Okay. It's quite cool. All right. So maybe at the end of this, we'll share all the different links and slides. Oh, yeah. Yep. There will be a recap blog. Trust me. Sounds good. So um, this is the first time I'm actually hearing uh, more details about the innovation labs. So maybe you can tell us. Uh, you mentioned that there are pop-up labs that can provide very similar um, um, services. But what, what is special about the physical labs that maybe people who, like me, like to travel, mm -hmm. who want to go and, and you know, how, how, how would you describe what the, the additional stuff you can provide at the physical labs? Um, oh, spaces. So, uh, by the way, what's the secret sauce about what we do? Um, it's the open part, so the open innovation labs. Um, I think, in some ways, I think that there's nothing special about the, the physical space at all. Um, but actually, we did design the physical spaces with a lot of intention about how we were using the space. So um, if you come and visit us in London, I hope some of you do come to London to visit. Um, it's kind of a funky space because we didn't have a, a, like a huge big room. It's quite a long, thin space. And we use it for a lot of different things. So we actually built it to be constantly changing. Um, so everything in the space is on wheels. So we even have lots of plants. I, I, I kind of, I actually originally wanted a a living wall in the space, but our uh, workplace solutions people told us that living walls are expensive, Jeremy, and we're an open source software company, so we don't make that much money. So you can't have a living wall, <laughs> but you can have some plants. So I said, can they all be on wheels? And they thought, well, I'm sure we can put them on wheels. So everything is on wheels. And the reason is because we wanted um, every team or, you know, we can host like up to about two two pizza teams in this main space. Every team can build the space for how they want to use it in their configuration. So part of the practice that we have, even in the pop-up um, labs that we do, is actually that the teams build their own physical space. Actually, um, other companies are also doing this. So Valve, who make um, computer games, all the desks in the office are um, sit-stand desks that the, the actual desktop machines that developers use are on a kind of mounted inside and um, they're all on wheels so literally when a developer wants to work with another team they can just unplug roll their desk somewhere else and, and actually plug in again and that's kind of the principle that, that we used um, so that's kind of cool also I should say if you come to us um, we basically surrounded most of the space with um, writable whiteboard walls and we didn't have enough space so we've actually taken over all the windows and um, we also have like post-it notes everywhere um, and I think that's one of the things that you can take from our physical space and I think if you talk to any of the people that have been in some of our residencies who are here um, is that we really like um, making all of the work that we do visible and transparent so that we can have a conversation about the work. So we actually use physical Kanban boards or physical sprint boards. Um, all of our architecture is kind of in the open. So that's some cool things. I could talk loads about it, but um, yeah. Sounds nice. I like to visit it myself. Mm -hmm. So um, I have more questions for our panel, but um, Maybe it's time for me to get some exercise. So if <laughs> there's anyone in the audience with some questions, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, come, on, shy. come on, Finland. Oh, you just we have we to need wait. to bring in the beers now. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, trick in, the trick in Finland is you just have to wait longer. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So um, for Ed, um, you, you mentioned about you know figuring out how, how an application can be containerized. But as, as um, Dero, when he talked about serverless, there are some cases where you don't go serverless. Is there some very obvious or you know, clear-cut cases that you don't containerize an app? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, so we, we touched on a couple of those in, in the uh, presentation around you know, maybe the architecture isn't quite right and things like that. But you might have applications which technically you could containerize, but maybe they're, they're nearing their end of life or they, um, the actual business value that you would get out of moving it into uh, OpenShift just doesn't justify the, that effort needed to do that. 
So um, that's quite often uh, you can see that. And what we typically um, end up with, when we do things like, um, and Jeremy mentioned things like Pathfinder, which help us make these sorts of assessments, is you look at a range of applications. Um, there's probably some very quick things that you can do to filter down, so you maybe get a body of applications, that, you know, a portfolio that we then go and do run those assessments on. Um, and then based on those, we might decide that uh, we'll just leave it alone. Uh, we might just be doing a rehost, so we just take the app, uh, put it in a container. We're not changing the app at all. We're just running it now in a container. Um, we talk about replatforming. So, uh, say you wanted to modernize, uh, say you're running a JE application, it was on, I don't know, JE6, and you wanted to go to JE7 or 8, then uh, we, can, we can do that, so we could replatform. Um, and then there's then you start getting into refactoring. So this is, but ideally, what you do in that first phase is to basically get the apps onto the platform, and the development teams adopting that, and the operational teams adopting, uh, adopting that approach as the way that we deliver that application into service. And then once you once you're at that point, you you've got you know what you might call a fast fast moving monolith, and so we can then very quickly then iterate around that and start making. Uh, improvements to it and innovating around that. Can, can I Thanks. comment on the sure. fast-moving monolith? So, so many of our customers are coming to the Open Innovation Labs to do microservices for the first time. And I really think that they're trying to go in the wrong direction and the fast-moving monolith is actually what they need. Um, the microservices introduce a super complex distributed system problem for developers. And the only reason you would do that is where your monolith cannot, you know, I think in the rule of thumb is that um, with a monolith usually, especially if it's basically down to the number of people that can concurrently work on that monolith at the same time. And the reason you go microservice is to split it out so more teams can work in parallel. But a lot of our customers are doing microservices with like a development team of six. And I don't understand that, right? So um, I know that it's kind of cool to do it, but I've, we've had to try to tell customers, look, maybe just take it back a bit and do the monolith, because um, that's all your business really needs. Because we all want to do cool technology. Um, I don't know if you've... One addition. You don't need the microservice to uh, start the cultural change. Yes, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Oh, very good considerations. I, I think, yeah, the, the thing about people always want to chase after the latest, coolest technology, and sometimes we need to pause and think about, is it really necessary? You know, it doesn't apply to all cases. So again, any questions? Good. All right, okay, run now. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, this is gonna We're going to get a Linux kernel question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, sort of. Um, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, well the technology is here, and the kind of uh, open source and everything like that is all about the community. So I would like to each of you to describe what is what do you consider the top first uh, most meaningful contribution to the community here? That we personally made or? Oh, oh my god. Um, <laughs> uh, in our entire lifetime, this, is, this could be interesting. Um, Oh, you've got the best. You you can tell the best stories, Diane. No, I think I, I'm the, the oldest stories probably. Um, I think some of the work uh, that I've done a lot of work in the early days of XML and HTML, um, and some of the XML standards, um, working on um, financial standards. Um, if any of you um, are filing corporate reports or doing anything with XBRL, it's not my fault really. <laughs> um, but yeah, so a lot of the, my very first experiences were with highly regulated industries, um, creating um, standards for that and doing open source contributions to some of the taxonomies around that. So um, it really ridiculously arcane account accounting knowledge. Um, but it taught me a lot about working with um, bringing open source awareness to companies that um, had a very restrictive um, interactions with other companies and how to create collabor collaboration in, in the financial sector, which is one of the toughest um, arenas and still working with other organizations like FinOS and um, banking industry standards groups or open source groups, uh, is they still struggle 
with being able to collaborate in the open. And I think we've cracked through a few of the walls, but there's still a lot more work to do. But that was that was sort of my first taste of community contribution. How about you? Well, I started my open source work roughly. I decided to check if I could get paid by just doing open source around year 2000. So uh, at the time I was working in the company that wasn't open for any kind of open source publishing because that time it was about do not release patents or something. It was mm -hmm. a heavy time of fear, <laughs> uncertainty and doubt. So my contribution at the time was uh, inside that company. So it was a rather, rather big company. So I was doing uh, all kinds of like Linux and Linux kernel maintenance and, and, and stuff like that, distribution maintenance for the company and building community around that within the company. Company was at the best more than 100,000 people, so it was like open community but within the walls. And uh, luckily got the chance to go to Linux cons and such events to like uh, interact with the other community members, but couldn't could not unfortunately post anything in the public at that time. Yeah. So so after that also similar it's also contributing to the community I think when you like for example this OpenStack Finn uh, group that I've been similar group group like not this big but anyway local meetup I think it's it was mm -hmm. 2012 or something when I started it. So acting as a kind of accelerator mm -hmm. for bringing ups up some communities. Maybe that. And nowadays, of course, everything, if I write some instruction or something, I pr mm. probably put it also into GitHub. I think for me, I have two personal stories to tell you. Um, with a friend of mine, Ed, some of you guys know Keith, um, I traveled through Africa on a motorcycle and if you go to two wheels to africa.com, the number two each time, you'll see our old website. Um, we accidentally ended up starting a software company in um, Cameroon. <laughs> and um, the. Um, Did the you get flat tire or something? Uh, Keith, <laughs> Keith, Keith had a problem with his. Uh, it's a very long story, but he had a problem with a little <sighs> magnet inside his uh, KTM that, uh, that basically stopped working in the engine, we had to get a part this size sent from Germany and it took four or five weeks and um, we had to go through customs. And in that time, we ended up starting a company, um, just the way it happens. Um, but basically, the company that we did was, um, was a software consultancy company. Um, and in the end, we did some local consulting we, um, within Cameroon and then we had um, we had a partner in Switzerland who gave us Photoshop files of designs of websites, and we created PHP themes in WordPress and plugins and stuff to make the, word the actual webs websites look like the Photoshop. Um, we, we employed some guys, but we turned our office into a co-working space, and that, this is the real reason w why we wanted to start our own company. We felt like um, we wanted to find Cameroonian guys who didn't have a lot of access to seed funding and capital, to um, find guys who were starting little internet companies in Cameroon, and we got them seed funding. Um, and um, in order to actually find these guys, we actually started Cameroon's first um, bar camp and first tech conference and for like developers. So that was super cool, and that was kind of community. Um, I've done lots of c contributions to open source in minor, tiny ways, I think. Most of my background is not Linux, it's Java. Uh, I worked at doing Java apps. Um, but I think the thing that I'm proud about now is, um, I think I contribute a lot towards Red Hat's commercial success. And I know that doesn't sound like really funny in a kind of a community way, but I'm really motivated by the idea that open source is transforming the world and making everywhere better. For Red Hat as a company to continue to exist, we need to make money. <laughs> we need <laughs> customers. And I feel like one way that I contribute to that is con the continued commercial success of, of Red Hat. Um, so while we have shareholders that are all very greedy and all the rest, I think that um, being able to satisfy them definitely helps us continue to do the open source thing that we're doing. Yes. So, sorry, exactly, long story. Exactly my words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, two uh, most recent is actually with Tanya and Diana arranging this event. Uh, 
but I haven't done a code contributions, but let's say that sometimes I find a feature in our product, so creating Bugzilla tickets, so informing about those features that we might have so that they can be fixed in the upstream. I think that that's the most important that I ha how I have influenced. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, I started in development actually, so um, like in the mid '90s, and um, around 2000 we started writing in Java as well. Um, so yeah, I, I started off as a developer. Um, I would I don't write code now, but if I do, then don't touch it because it'd be horrible. <laughs> um, you can do a container. Yeah, <laughs> it would be nicely contained. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But it, what, what we found with um, so doing Java in sort of the early 2000s was there were all these libraries and we could start building uh, stuff together. And I became more and more aware of open source as a, as, a, as a real force for good from a technical perspective as well in that we, were, we could build um, our application in a way that was right for that application and the application design and not be locked into making choices that were there to drive a particular proprietary business case um, that we would if we were buying software from a, from a, from a vendor. Um, so I, I felt it actually improved the quality of our software, it was still pretty bad, um, <laughs> by using open source uh, technology. Um, I'd say uh, nowadays, moving on, um, it actually getting involved in communities, it doesn't need, it can be, you know, as Taro was saying, we can, uh, you know, contribute just by raising issues, or um, you know, there may be like a, a docs bug or something like that. And um, I mean, just I remember the first time getting uh, a PR accepted. It's like, wow, this is really cool. I'm really part of something. Uh, and it was just a really simple thing. It must have been like one line of code or something. Mm. But um, that that kind of stuff is is really great, and it you really f it really feels like you're you're. Um, you know, you're actually contributing something really valuable and worthwhile. Um, so that's my experience. Great question. I actually got to learn a lot from of my own colleagues. <laughs> and um, I've actually heard of um, Two Wheels to Africa. I just didn't, well, nice to meet you in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I agree, uh, contribution to community is, you know, not just code, you know, organizing events, um, attending events, telling your friends about it, uh, translations, design, there are many, many ways you can contribute. And uh, I'm actually going to abuse my moderator privilege and tell you a little bit from my point of view what I did. Um, I used to work for Nokia, and um, we were I was working in the video uh, multimedia team, and we contributed to this uh, open source project called uh, Helix Engine. I don't know if anybody know about that. My real networks, it was a, a cross-platform multimedia um, framework. So that was my f also first uh, open source kind of um, experience. Well, I, I've used Linux before, but more as a user. But so that was that. But there wasn't as much of a community around it. So I would say uh, even more um, influence or, or uh, stuff that I did was after leaving Nokia, I started organizing like Migo meetups and later joined Yola, the company which I think many of you here might know, and uh, built a community around Selfish OS. So. And of course, then uh, a couple of years later, I'm here at Red Hat doing more for open source and for the community. All right, thanks for that question. Any others? I, I would add one more thing to the, the experiences and community, um, not needing to be code um, mm -hmm. contributions. One of the very early jobs, um, I'm a Python person, not a Java person. I'm, am I the only Python person on stage? Probably. Um, no. yes, all right, good. <laughs> all right, there's more than one of us, and, and we do no go. Yes. But um, one of the first jobs I had um, for the Python community was reviewing all the licenses in all of the readmes, in all of the Python libraries for active states um, distribution of Python. And talk about learning curve, you know, like, and, you know, because you made, needed to make sure there wasn't like a poison pill um, kind of license in the distribution and that somebody hadn't snuck one in or forgotten to put one in. So my um, big lesson that I learned through that was I probably could tell you, yeah, um, all the different licenses that are out there in the Python world or were about 10 years ago. Um, but also the one thing that I would always say is if you're contributing code back in there, make sure you put a license in there. Mm -hmm. Don't leave that blank because that is almost worse than putting a bad license in or a, a, 
a, a, a prohibitive license in there because by not putting one in, you're causing anyone who consumes your code um, ha to have to go back and review it and reach out to you, find you, and get you to put it in, or it breaks um, their license agreements too. So um, there's lots of aspects of community and contribution that you can really help with, but if my one pet peeve is please pick a license, put it in there, and make it in your repo, and make it available. Can I make a comment on the license thing? I think don't just pick the most permissive license be really thoughtful yes. about what you're doing when you're doing the license. And um, also when you put a license on a piece of work, um, it kind of affects that work. And if someone finds that you had an old license and you changed it, there's some implications. So, and, and my personal view is um, I would strongly recommend that you consider uh, the copyleft licenses mm -hmm. if for, for a lot of use cases. Um, to protect your work. I, I think about it like DJs. If you don't mind that another DJ remixes your work and gets a record hit and makes all the money from it, then go for it and put a permissive license on it. But if you th want to somehow make sure that that DJ who makes a piece of music from your work, you can then remix their work and use their work to make other hits, then make sure you put a copyleft license on it. And I, I, I think um, the, the, there's a little bit of an interesting Redis story that's just kicked off. Oh so um, that's what can happen if you don't quite pick the right license. So um, yeah, just think about it like in the concept of DJs remixing music. If you're OK that someone can take a piece of your work and make it proprietary, and you don't have access to that work anymore, the thing about copyleft is that you can all, you, if they make a fork and it's better than what you did, you can always pull it back into your work. Whereas if it's permissive, you, it, the remixability disappears. Yep. Just a thought. There you go. Yeah. We could have a long conversation about that. <laughs> but yes, thank yeah. you for bringing that up. Good. Great advice. Daryl, did you have something? If, uh, if you want to contribute, feel free to catch us from the uh, meetup.com and have an OpenShift meetup. Mm -hmm. If you have a team, you have a venue, you have free beer, that's fine. We can help you. We can help you find a speaker if you have a topic. We can find speakers. So if you want to basically mm. build this OpenShift com community in Finland. Yeah. Yeah, very good. <laughs> um, any other questions? Or for each other, perhaps? I, I would also add, uh, along with the meetup stuff, is uh, we do uh, on OpenShift Commons tons of OpenShift Commons briefings, like two to three a week. And the SIGs do, usually when the SIGs happen, I make them do at least two mini talks within each SIG meeting on different topics. So there's lots of content out there. But what I'm always interested in is hearing what you want to hear about. Uh, so if there's a topic that we didn't cover today that you want to hear more about, um, could you let us know over beer or something mm. like that? Or if there's a topic that you want to talk about, if there's some open source project that you want to you know, hear about, um, on pontific pontificate about or promote, please let us know. We really, um, I always joke, I don't like to hear the sound of my own voice anymore. I mean, I really want to hear what, um, what's going on out there. And um, we've been, talking a lot of, um, on the sidelines today over coffee at different times about trying to figure out what the next big thing is. And a couple of things have happened, um, two, two things. is One, because OpenShift and Red Hat is doing so much work on Kubernetes, we, get, we really get a lot of insight into where Kubernetes is going and stuff. So you know, I'm going to try and do a little research about you know, what the network effect is, where the next um, hotness is in the Kubernetes world. And it's very hard to predict that. But um, I also think that there's quite, quite a bit of, you know, one of the things that's been wonderful about being part of the Kubernetes there is sometimes I get to be one of the reviewers for the call for papers for a KubeCon. And I think KubeCon this time had over 6,000 submissions. Right, so if you submitted to KubeCon and you didn't get accepted, don't feel bad because there really weren't, I forget exactly how many speaking slots, but it was like somewhere on the order of 300 speaking slots, so you, know, you didn't get in. But if you get asked to be the reviewer of a conference, volunteer and say yes, because you can't believe how much you learn about 
what the new things are or what people want to talk about and are passionate about. And I have learned so much by just looking at the agendas for conferences and reviewing people's papers um, about what's coming down the pike. But it's you guys out there that are really going to help us understand where we should be going with OpenShift and with Kubernetes and with all of the other projects at Red Hat. So please, if you have topics that we didn't cover today or we're not going to cover tomorrow at the Red Hat Forum, um, please let us know and, and tell us o over the beer that's coming shortly. <laughs> There's a promise of beer. <laughs> oh, and shouldn't they also present at the comments? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, customer stories. Customer stories are great. We are, if you are a POC, a production use case, if you're an OKD user, you're an online, a dedicated, a Google Cloud, an Azure user, if you've got a, a production case study um, and you want to talk about your journey like the folks did earlier today, um, please let me know because, again, I don't, I mean, I. I, I probably look like I, I love the sound of my own voice because I talk so damn much. But I really want to hear what, yeah, and have you share your stories so that everybody learns from your lessons um, and your war stories and your successes. So that's really key to keeping the conversations and the stories flowing. I really like uh, Ilga's drawings and also his voice. So I'd like to ask you a question. <laughs> you, you talked about like uh, being like uh, Gimme Raikkonen, where you know you focus on stuff and don't worry about the things um, happening behind you and gain speed. But occasionally something you know might you, you might be blindsided and, and something hits you or something. How, how do you deal with that? How how can you prevent it or how do you recover from it? I think the openness could be something that that if if you just do stuff on your own, you, you get blind to whatever you do. So also when you create such a forum where you open up, let others open up, you also and be open for the criticism and, and discussions. When you have healthy discussions, I think that's the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would add that um, whatever whatever approach you adopt, you need to be looking at an agile approach where, you, where you're able to assess uh, what, you, what you're doing in the, in the you know the direction that you're going uh, at regular short-term intervals, mm. um, and so if if the unexpected happens, then you're able to adapt adapt your plans and change and reconfigure around that. Yeah. What's the largest thing of your drawings? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. Well, is, is it license or is it um, is it a Creative Commons? Yeah. It's Creative Commons. All oh, right, <laughs> we'll, we'll put the, the deep end of the <laughs> those, pool. Those those I actually don't need back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You don't I want to remix it's, those? <laughs> it, it's really funny that you mentioned openness is the place to start with some of this because when we've been, what we've been learning as we've worked with customers in their transformations is that um, w we talk about the pillars of open organizations, but we found that transparency is actually the first step in um, transforming organizations. Just sharing more widely the work that you're doing and making your work visible um, is a really powerful part of that. So I agree. It's like mm -hmm. a really interesting. It's part of breaking down the silos, really. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. All right. Any other questions for our lovely panel? No technical questions. They want, technical they want the beer. Oh, I yes. OK. Let's why don't we, why don't we um, wrap, up? wrap up? I'll do the closing bits, and okay. then we'll get to the beer. Yeah. I promise. Big hand for the panel. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.